Hello and welcome to Thursday's edition of Cracking the Cryptic and on screen we have a very rare thing. Uh, this is a puzzle by Samantha Mukherjee uh, who we've covered um, one of Samantha's puzzles before about three weeks ago. It was an absolutely gorgeous puzzle and this our testers say is its equal um, and this is a tribute to one of Samantha's favorite Sudoku compilers. So he wrote us an email and said that his favorite two compilers were Sam Kappelman Lines and Ard van der Vettering. And this is his tribute puzzle to Ard. Um, now, I'll tell you the rules in a moment. There's a couple of things I have to mention first. Um, Thermo Sudoku, it's out on the App Store. So if you've been looking forward to it, um, I mean, we've been massively excited about it coming out, um, then yeah, you can get it if you, uh, if you have an Apple device. If you're waiting for the Steam or the Google Play uh, version, we have told them to release it, but it's out of our control. So, so hopefully they will release it soon. Um, I'll put the links under the video so you guys can keep checking. Um, so yeah, it's a big day for us. Our fourth app coming out, and um, yeah, we, we really hope you enjoy uh, what we've produced. Um, what else? Well, on Patreon, free at the, uh, today, we have a new junior puzzle hunt. So we know that everyone um, is struggling a bit with lockdown. Certainly that's what our email uh, inbox is telling us. Um, and well, Scott Strosal, who some of you will know sets extremely good puzzles for adults, has set a junior puzzle hunt for kids. It's always hard to guess the age ranges that you know it's, it's perfect for. I think eight to 13, something like that. It's quite a wide band. Um, I enjoyed solving it though, um, and, and two other of the testers enjoyed solving it. So, um, you know, if, you, if you're if you an adult and you have a few minutes spare, I think, I think you'll get a lot out of it. Actually, for some adults, I think it will be a really, really good puzzle. And I won't tell you why, but uh, do check it out. I'll put a link under the video. Now, what have we got today? Well, this tribute to Ard, um, let's go through the rules. We've got a thermometer in the grid. We've got one thermometer, which is appropriate for today. Um, so remember with a thermometer, the idea is that there's a bulb in the thermometer. This has to have the lowest digit along the thermometer, and then numbers must increase as we move away from the bulb. So that's how thermometers work. Now, this being a tribute to Ard van der Vettering, this gray square in the middle is a magic square. So how do magic squares work? Very easy. Every row, every column, and the two main diagonals have to add up to the same number. Now, if you've been following the channel for a while, you will already know a thing or two about three by three magic squares, but we'll look at that when we get to the solve. Now, the final uh, extra condition for this puzzle is a knight's move constraint. So that means, let's look at this square. Let's say this square had a four in it, for example. If this uh, was a chess knight in this cell, it could jump to that square, that square, that square, that square. It could jump to, oh dear, misclicked, sorry. That wouldn't be good for my eSports career. Um, there we go. So all of those squares are in reach of the four by a chess knight, and therefore none of these yellow squares can contain a four. So you cannot repeat a digit in a cell that is a knight's move away. Um, and that's all there is to it. Um, as I say, this, this has got startlingly good reviews, so I'm looking forward to trying it. Do have a go yourselves, you just click on the link under the video. And with that, let's get cracking. Um, now, actually, let me start, let me delete that, and start with the magic square. So, the trick to solving a three by three magic square is to recognize that those nine digits there have to, have to be the numbers one to nine because they're in a three by three box. Therefore, we can add them up. If we add them up, we get 45. And that is incredibly important because now, if we look at this square carefully, we can see it contains one, two, three rows. So if the total for the box is 45, the total for each of those three rows must be 15 because we just divide 45 by three. And that gives us the total for the magic square. So we now know we're looking for every row, column, and diagonal to add to 15. And then we can do some more logic to think about the various ways you can combine numbers to make 15 with three digits, three digits that only include the numbers one to nine anyway. Um, and the way to think about this, I think that's the best, is to appreciate that there is a different quality to some of the cells in this square. So let's, let's have a look firstly at the corner squares. 
Now if we focus in on one of these corner squares, let's think about this one. How many ways of making 15 is this particular square party to? And you can see it's part of this row, one way, this column, two ways, and this diagonal, three ways. So every square, every corner square in the magic square is part of three different ways of making 15. Let's compare that with these squares, look. These ones at the center of an edge, how many different sums are they party to? Well, they're party to one in their row and one in their column. So these are only party to two different ways of making 15. And finally, I'm sure you've all spotted it, the central square. This central square is the key because this is party to its column, its row, and both diagonals. So this has the unique property within the magic square that it must be party to four different ways of making 15. Now, if you were to run through the numbers and list all the ways there are of making 15, you would find that there is only one number that, that has this criteria that can be part of four different sums, and that's the number five. So we, we actually know straight away we can write a five into the center of the grid. And you can prove that to yourselves by thinking about if we had five here, we then have to find four different ways of making 10 without using five. And there are four different ways because one plus nine, two plus eight, three plus seven, four plus six. So this is why five has to go in the center. Now, there's an interesting property. The corner squares and these squares all have a property in common. Well, if these four squares have a property in common, these four squares have a property in common. Uh, perhaps the easiest way to think about that is to consider a big number. Let's consider nine. Um, let's put the nine here just for the sake of exposition. So if the nine was here, you can see that with the five, this square would have to be a one to give 15. So how many different ways are there of making 15 without using a one and a five for the number nine? Well, we know we must need another six um, because nine plus six is 15. We can't use one and five to get six. We could use two and four, but we can't use three and three because that would repeat the three. So in fact, nine can never live in the corner of a magic square. And if you run through the logic, you'll find that that is true for all of the odd numbers, apart from five, obviously. The odd numbers have to live in those squares. And that is very nice to know. And then you'll find that the even digits have to live in the corners. They can all be party to three different ways to make 15. So straight off the bat, look, we've got we've got some logic done. Um, and what I like about this, of course, is it's such a tribute to Ard van der Vettering, whose, whose puzzle, uh, which we titled something like a puzzle with only four different given digits, has now 3.65 million views. So almost certainly the most famous Sudoku of all time um, and a testament to Ard's setting quality. Um, now, now I'm going to look at the thermometer though. If we look at this thermometer, we've got five in the middle. The bulb is this side, so this number has to be below five. So it can only be two and four, or two or four, and it can't be two. Why can't it be two? Well, we know this would have to be less than two because it's closer to the bulb. That would have to be a one. That square would then have to be a zero. Now there's no zeros in Sudoku, or not least in this Sudoku. So two is impossible, that's got to be a four. So that's got to be a two or a three, that's got to be a one or a two. Now, so that's got to be greater than five. Oh, and that can't be an eight. So it's exactly the same, the logic is sort of mirrored. Uh, if this was an eight, that would be a nine, this would have to be a 10 and we can't put a 10 in the Sudoku. So this has to be six. This must be a seven or an eight. This must be an eight or a nine. Now, don't forget, once we've got four and six in here, we can delete four and six as options from the other two corner squares. And that's gonna limit the options for these two squares, isn't it? Because if this was eight, this would need to be a three. 
if this was two, this would be a, need to be a nine. So this can only be three or nine. It can't be one or seven. And the same must be true of that square because obviously the options for this square are just the mirrors of whatever we put in that square. In fact, that is an interesting thought. So we've got a three nine pair here. So these two squares can't be three nine. Um, hmm. I'm just noticing that this grid has an awful lot of symmetry about it. If we just look at the given digits, we've got given twos and eights, and they are rotationally symmetric. Which, uh, let me explain what I mean by that. So if we look at this square, and we imagine that we uh, we cut this, this grid out and flipped it 180 degrees around the central square, where would this square end up? Well, it would end up here. Where would this square end up? It would end up there. Where would this square end up? It would end up there. And the interesting thing I'm wondering about is that the twos, well, that this two is flipping to an eight. This two is flipping to an eight. These two squares would also flip. You know, the eights, if this was a two, it would flip to an eight. If this was a two, it would flip to an eight. So let's keep an eye on that. That is, it's uh, if if this Sudoku is symmetrical, there'll be lots and lots of beauty about the solve. Now let's just take a stare and see if we can. Yeah, you see, look at this. Look at this. We've got three. There must be a three in one of these squares. So this square is a knight's move away. So we've used we've used the magic square. We've used the thermometer. And now we can use the knight's move constraint to say this square cannot be a 3. If that's a 3, neither of those squares could be a 3, and that doesn't work. So this is a 2. That must be a 1. <laughs> and, okay, we are seeing symmetry, aren't we? Because let's apply this exact same logic on this side of the grid. Can this square be a 7? And the answer is no, because these squares are a knight's move away from that square. So this square has to be an eight, and that makes that square a nine. And wow, okay. So again, the two is flipping onto an eight. The five, which is in the center of the grid, has no symmetrical counterpart. And that that is interesting. So five would always reflect onto itself, and you can see that it is in the corners of the grid. Wow, okay. So I'm pretty confident now. I'll be even more... I'll be... Yeah, in fact, with the structure of a magic square, if this is a 3, this has to be a 7. If this is a 9, this has to be a 1. Yeah, so we do have, at this point, we have a symmetrical Sudoku, which means that we could apply Girth symmetrical placement to this puzzle. Now, girth symmetrical placement is an obscure piece of Sudoku theory, which says that if you have symmetrical givens in a Sudoku, the, the solution must be symmetrical itself if that solution is unique. Now, we know this has a unique solution because we never cover puzzles on Cracking the Cryptic that don't have unique solutions. Now, I'm not going to go into girth symmetrical placement in this video because it would make the video very long, but I will put a link or I'll put a card actually on the screen now for you guys to have a look at a video that talks about it. it it's, it's a fascinating topic. Um, but wow, so what we're going to find as we solve this is that logic is going to be symmetrical. So wherever we find something, we can look at that digit symmetrical counterpart and apply that logic there as well. This is going to be amazing. This is going to be amazing. Let's try and do some Sudoku then. We've got twos twos here and here. So this little square, that can't be a two because it's a knight so it move away from both squares. So that's a two in one of those positions. Um, twos. This can't be a two. There must be a two in one of those squares. And in fact, look, we'll, let's do it now. Let's do it now. So the symmetrical counterpart to the digit two is, a, is an eight. So we should be able to look at eights and find symmetrical count. So we should be able to pencil eights into those two squares. And we can, look, exactly the same logic. We should be able to 
also here because if we rotate these pencil marks 180 degrees we get those two squares where we can pencil mark eights isn't that cool um now what do we do next though that's the that's the question sorry i'm just going to have to look at this for at least a moment while i try and spot something useful Twos. Ah, now, oh my goodness me, oh my goodness me, watch, watch this, pause the video, pause the, in fact, pause the video if you haven't spotted something utterly extraordinary, because I'm about to show you something utterly extraordinary, and it's to do with the fives. Now, the fives here are positioned in such a way that they are going to rule out fives from the whole perimeter of the grid. Look at this. Now, let's consider this five in the center and ask which squares this rules out. Well, obviously by Sudoku, it rules out its column and its row. But because of the knight's move constraint, it rules out that one, 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 and that one. And now have a look at the grid and ask where fives can go in this box, this box, this box, and this box. How gorgeous is that? Because this means straight away we've only got two cells in each of these boxes that can contain five, and those boxes already contain pencil mark digits, so we can instantly write in five into all those squares. These four have to be a two five pair. These four have to be a five eight pair. Oh, wow. Um, now, what can we do next? Uh, <laughs> five, fives. Ah. Yes, so five now, if we look at the five here, where can a five go in this box? It can only go there. Now, I therefore expect this box to be the same, and the logic is identical. Look, fives, fives, that has to be a five. We've now got three, four, we've got five of the fives placed, and I suppose the other four are all pencil marked. Um, ah, what now? We only have to find the logic. Effectively now we have to solve half of half of Sudoku because the logic will apply the other way around on the other side of the grid. But we still have to solve half of it. Ah, these eights. So that's locking an eight into one of those positions. Now this 8 means that there can't be an 8 in those three squares. And if we look at the pencil marking of these 8s, there can't be, there couldn't be an 8 there either, because if there was an 8 here, it would rule out all three of those cells, because it would rule out this one by knight's move and these two just by normal Sudoku. So the 8 has to be in one of those positions. Ah, no, it doesn't, actually. It doesn't. It can't be. Ah, look, eights here and here and here. Now this, oh, this is going to be beautiful. So now, if we think about where eights go in this box, you can see they're locked into column four and column six. Where do eights go in this box? They're locked into column four and column six. So in this box up here, where can the eight go? Well, the eight can't possibly go. We can't have more eights in column four and column six. We only need two eights for those two columns and we know where they are. So there must be an eight in one of these three squares. But we've just looked at this. This can't be an eight. And if we pencil mark the eights here, just to remind you, if that's an eight, it rules out all of those three possibilities. So in fact, that is an eight. Oh, that's an eight. 
now, and neither of these squares can now be an 8 for the same reason because that sees that one normally and that one by knight's move so this has to be an 8 and now oh look I can see lots of things now I mean not only can we see the pencil marked 8s in here but look this 8 is seeing this 2 8 pair but but before we get to that let's just let's just consider what the logic on these 8s means we know the symmetric counterpart is the 2 so I'm predicting we're going to come down here and apply that exact logic and we're going to find there's a 2 here um, so let's just try and do that so the 2s here and here they interact on this box lock a 2 into one of those squares and the 2 8 here and the 2s there again they force a 2 into one of these three positions this 2 takes care of that one this 2 can't be a 2 because of those three that has to be the 2 and we get this matching up pattern now that rules out those two you may recognize that logic and now we get pencil mark twos identically on this side of the grid and this 2 8 pair operate identically on these two squares holy moly so now this one obviously can't be 8 that's got to be 2 that one's got to be 8 oh wow and now we get 2 5 here 5 8 there and this 8 sees this square so that becomes 5 and 8 that becomes 5 and 2 and look these 2s and 8s, they are beautiful in terms of their effect on this triple here. This 8 rules out that one naturally and that one by knight's move. So that has to be the 8. And same logic there, of course, rules out those as being the 2. And we get the 2 positioned as well. And now, now we can do the magic square. Because we've now got 4, 2 here. That's got to be a 9. Which means that's got to be a 1 that's got to be a three that's got to be a seven I think Ard is going to approve of this puzzle Samantha I really do um, okay so so now we've done the twos the fives and the eights so we have to find another digit now to focus on you can see actually we haven't nines yes nines here oh nines here are perfect because this nine and this nine look how powerful they are we rule out those we rule out those by normal sudoku but this nine sees that one by knight's move and that one therefore that's got to be a nine must be a nine in one of these two and we can just flip over here and do exactly the same with the ones look at this so that gives us a 1 here. We can pencil mark 1s at the bottom. Uh, then, oh, there must be a 1 in one of those two squares from these ones. So let's just apply the same. It's weird actually how I saw the 1. I looked at the 9s first and didn't get the pencil mark 9s down here. And when I looked at the 1s, I found it even though I looked at it second. That shows that I'm not diligent in how I do my pencil marking, which I guess a lot of you could have told me already. Um, now, 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 look at this square. Look at that square. And think about what it does to box four. Because that is, it's just gorgeous. It rules out all four of those squares these two by sudoku these two are knights moves away from that square so that square has got to be a six which means this is a one now six six so this must be a six just by sudoku rules um and of course what we can do presumably this yes yes this four so this four is the is symmetrical counterpart of this six and look we can just do the logic again on this side sorry if I sound like a broken record but it is it is just gorgeous isn't it this puzzle is so symmetrical now fours must go here now to complete this row 
You see the fours and six retain their symmetry. So these should all be the same digits. And they are, yes, they're three and seven. Um, okay, so what do we do now? What do we do now? So, oh, no. oh, look at this, look at this box. Have a stare at that box. You can place a digit in it. And it's really very nice indeed. Look at the fours, this four and this four. This four rules out those two. This four, believe it or not, is a knight's move away from both those two open positions. So the four gets shifted there, which means there's a, oh, now, now look at this box because the four must be in one of those three squares. And this four takes care of both of those positions because of the knight's move. So that becomes a four. That's a knight's, ah. Oh. Yeah, and this we can continue this. This is a knight's move from that four. That four rules out that one. That's a four. So there must be a four down here. We've also got these two fours locking a four into one of those two squares. Look. Now. Oh, and actually over here we can do something similar because this square can't be a four because of that one so we get more fours pencil marked that locks fours into row seven and row nine so where does the four go in row eight it can only go in that square and what's so amazing about this is that we've just done all this lovely logic and we can just do it again with sixes we are going to be able to use this six i'm sure and this six and we can they work it works exactly the same way that's ruled out, that's ruled out, that gets a six placed in the grid. This six takes care of those two squares. This six sees that one, that six sees that one. We get this, oh, wow, I didn't mean to do that. Um, I want to put a six in there. That's a six now. There must be a six in one of these two squares and there must be a six in one of those two squares. My goodness me. Now, what do we need in here? We need three, seven, nine into these squares. Oh, now, this is again absolutely beautiful setting of a Sudoku. I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. I mean, this, this is something else because can this square ever be a three or a seven? Well, the answer is no. If I try and put a three or a seven in this square, it removes both of the options from those two positions. So this, this can only be a nine. That's the only option for it. Now, the moment we write that in, we can come down here and write in one, but let's check the logic. These squares can only be one, three, or seven. That can't be three or seven for the same reason. That is a one. Nines now must be in one of those two cells, which, ah, now that creates a four, nine pair. So let's, let's write that in that way so there must be a one six pair over here and there is okay I'm not surprised by that but it's nice to see it okay now probably what do we do next so these two squares at the top of and bottom of column five have to be they have to be three and seven as well and so in this box, what are we looking for? We're looking for, oh, one, three, seven again. Yeah, okay. So that's three or seven, which means the symmetrical counterpart must be three or seven. Ah, got it. This one. This one uh, is locks the knight's move away out of those two positions. So the one must be in one of those two squares which means that square is a one, that square is a one. This one must be a three or a seven. That gives us a three, seven pair there, look. So this must be four or nine, and it's not gonna be able to be nine because of the knight's move. So that has to be four, that's four, that's nine. 
that's not four. Let's make sure we've recorded that correctly. And we can just presumably reverse the logic. Where do we start with that? We started with ones up here. So nines here must have the same effect, and they do. That's a nine. This is a nine. This is a one. This is a one. This is a six. That's a six. Have you... I mean, we've been blessed with some amazing Sudokus on this channel recently, but this this is right up there in terms of beauty. Um, three... Ah, oh, no. Have I broken the puzzle? I've just got three sevens. No, I haven't, because the three sevens are going to get um, disambiguated by the central central magic square. And look, we've only got three sevens left in the grid. They all get fixed by this. This... Oh... This is a special puzzle, guys. This is a special puzzle. Three, seven, three, seven, three, seven, seven, three, three, seven, check. That is how to solve Samantha's tribute to Ard van der Vettering. And Ard, I know you'll have enjoyed that. And Samantha, I can, I can pay you no greater compliment than I think this is a very fitting tribute. Um, and... Yeah, Ard, if you are watching, do let us know what you thought. Guys, and obviously all our viewers, please do comment on this video and tell me uh, what you thought of this puzzle. I This is a, a masterpiece. Absolutely incredible. Thanks for watching, and we'll be back later with another edition of Cracking the Cryptic.